today we are going to be looking at what does it mean to be modern? So take a moment at this very beginning and answer what makes a work of art look quote unquote modern to you? Now, as we are going on in this series of ideas about art, here is why we have to confront these issues that can sometimes make people cranky when they're talking about art or be a little bit frustrating to deal with. Someday you are going to come up to a piece of art in a museum and either you or someone that you know is going to ask why. Why is this piece here? This lecture on modernity is important because modernity shaped the world that we have today. We still very visibly see the fingerprints of the modern age all around us, even though we are no longer in the modern age. But relatively few people actually grasp what being modern really means. In fact, modern is rarely what people think it means at all. So that is why I'm asking if you had to take a whack at it, what would you say makes an artwork modern? Now modernity is a tricky thing to talk about in art. And one thing that is going to help us is we are going to establish two terms that can often be confused in casual conversation. Modernity is not the same thing as contemporary. Contemporary means of the current movement. So what artworks are being made by artists who are alive today? Modern relates to a specific period of time. Contemporary will always change as time changes. It will always continue to move forward. Modern is fixed with a definable starting and end point. Modern art specifically dealt with reactions in the creative field to the new lifestyles and understandings of the way the world operates thanks to the technological advances of the industrial age that created a radical social upheaval in pretty much every facet of the world that you can imagine. If you think about it, within the span of a few decades, social classes, medicine, countries, how we understand time, how we understand ourselves fundamentally changed. The world was shifting and modern art represented reactions to that radical shift. Modern art can also be hard to pin down because there is no one visual style for the whole period. But what links modern art across the board is the rejection of traditional styles and values in preference of the desire to portray a subject according to the artist's individual or subjective perspective. Think about how the scream reflects Munch's unique experience rather than the actual objective view of what was occurring on that night in nature. Prior to modern art, most styles were not so much about the individual unique moment as it felt to the artist, but how to make the subject fit into a set of idealized parameters. Paintings of famous leaders, for example, were less about how the individual appeared or what they meant to the artists, and more about making that individual fit within a set of ideals that aligned with the values of the culture or the time period. This is why we tend to think that paintings of people from older centuries all look alike. These paintings were idealized. This portrait is not about who the Elizabeth I was as a person or the experience of spending time with her. This portrait is all about what Elizabeth I represents as a queen and leader of a nation. This renewed interest in the experience and the eyes of the artist actually had a lot to do with technology. With the Industrial Revolution came the onset of mass production and the rise of techniques of the multiple, like printmaking or photography. So on the one hand, this was awesome because it allows the transfer of information across the world at increasingly rapid speeds, and it shifts the acquisition of art from being a thing that was only available to a privileged few because art takes time and skill and labor, so you have to pay a person for that. And the class systems up to that point only produced a small amount of people who could afford those sums to a commodity that could be accessed by large amounts of people. 
the middle class became a thing. And with this new population that could suddenly afford art, there was a demand for more and more objects to visually communicate their position in society. But on the other hand, this sends many fine artists into a panic. Because quite suddenly, you don't need a painter or a sculptor every time you want your portrait to be made or a great work of art to be copied. You don't need a potter to individually make each dish by hand. Skills that took a lifetime to perfect became devalued with the rise of machinery. So the fine arts had to undergo this radical transition in the light of mass production. And what many artists would cling to was something that, as of yet, no machine has been able to reproduce. And that is the unique subjective experience of the artist. Modern art came into full bloom in the 1870s with Impressionism. Impressionists were fascinated with light and time. We've talked about this briefly in our previous lectures. And all that these Impressionists want to do is to capture the world as they believe it really is. A series of moments captured in light. You can tell here that the photography was just coming about because that's exactly what a camera does. It captures a series of moments through light. Basically, every movement from that point on into the 1960s follows that same theme, looking for universal truths rooted in the subjective viewpoints of the artist. The best analogy I can think of for that is if you think about the frame that holds a painting. Prior to modern art, what work was inside of that frame shifts from acting like a mirror that reflects the conventions of the outside world to being a window revealing the inner workings of the artist. So go ahead now and give me an example of each of these things. An example of an artwork that you believe behaves like a mirror, so it reflects outside conventions within the artwork, and an artwork that you believe acts like a window. It looks into the interior mind of the artist. It reflects their unique experiences. This window could be the cubists asking questions about the fractured experiences of a world gone mad. It could be the surrealists seeking to understand the subconscious through metaphors or altered states of mind. The window could be viewed as the abstract expressionist saw it, wishing to strip away the artifice of illusion and find truth in the pure qualities of your medium. Though each came to radically different conclusions, each movement starts from the same place. How am I breaking free from the ties of everything that has come before me to make art a wholly unique, original experience? And that's actually kind of exhausting because each new movement that comes to the forefront is going to say, you know what? Those guys before me were idiots. Art's not about light. It's about feeling. No, no, no. It's not about conscious feeling. It's about the subconscious mind. No, it's about leaving the excesses of industrialization behind and embracing a more primitive lifestyle. Or maybe no, it's about stripping away imitation. And these styles each become increasingly more militant and will adopt the name avant-garde, which is the French word for the front lines. These artists are taking on the mindset of crushing change within the world, and you either get with the program or you get left behind. And it is that mindset of modernity that is troubling, especially to contemporary or quote-unquote postmodern thought, which we will be addressing when we talk about contemporary art. And it also can be a little distressing to those who have not been trained in the arts. First, there is this problem. When the only thing that you ground your artwork in, the only thing that gives it value is, well, no one ever thought of it before, that's a pretty cheap way to generate value. Now, at first, innovative ideas are welcoming and refreshing, but that initial reaction does not last. And when that is over, what are you left with? That's something to consider when you are making your own artwork. Where does the value lie? Does it lie merely in novelty, or is there, in fact, a deeper meaning to go along with it? And this difficulty to, quote-unquote, 
get modern art is frustrating, especially because it confuses the issue of exactly who art is supposed to be for. Is art only for artists or is it for the whole world? And then the second thing I want to look at is that phrase I mentioned earlier, where universal truths are rooted in the subjective experience. Now, we're not in a philosophy class, and I'm not questioning the existence of any universal truth in the world, but there is a huge point of contention in that statement that can be brought against modern movements. First, notice the order. These artists believe that their subjective viewpoints translate to real, objective truths. Rather than basing your opinions on facts, you are trying to draw facts from your opinions. Secondly, all these subjective viewpoints come from one very specific, highly homogenous culture group. And that tiny group represents basically the entire modern art world experience with very few token exceptions. In other words, the art of a relatively small group of people wrote history for everyone. And because this group had a history of unchallenged access to power, they believed in their heart of hearts that their subjective viewpoints steeped in one specific class, culture, race, and gender represented truth and experience for the entire world. We spent a lot of time in this class talking about representation in art. So I am going to leave it there because we do explore it further in other places. But again, we are right back to those issues of bias and agenda that we talked about at the very beginning of this course. History is being written each and every day. Have you asked yourself who is writing the story of the world you see around you? And even if their intentions are benign, whose interests will they best represent? Theirs or yours? 